Hi everyone, my name is Veyune Jamaitita and I'm a senior research fellow at Kudan Open Lab at Tallinn University. Um, today I'll speak briefly about using cultural data analytics methods for understanding today's cinema. Let me see. So the plan for today is really just to give a short introduction about myself first, um, then I'll speak about cinema data in cultural data analytics, what databases or data sets we use uh, to study cinema using these cultural data analytics methods. Uh, I will also speak about the methods themselves, so different techniques you could take under the umbrella of cultural data analytics to study cinema. Um, and the majority of my talk will really be different examples of work that we have performed over the years using cultural data analytics approach to study cinema. Um, but firstly, uh, a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I started my academic career back in 2015. Back then I was based in Australia and I did my PhD in communication in collaboration with the kinematics research team of interdisciplinary researchers. Um, whilst I was in the communications department, I was really focusing on using these data-driven uh, methods uh, to analyze global cinema. I will speak a bit more about that project uh, in the later slides. Um, during and after my PhD, I was also working as a researcher across different institutions in Australia um, as part of Royal Melbourne Institute of Technologies, RMIT Be Behavioral Business Lab. We were running these experiments uh, with artists and entrepreneurs looking into uh, what determines a person's creativity or how creative different groups are. I was also working with the University of Technology Sydney, and there we started looking at applying these social network analysis methods to studying gender diversity in film production. I will talk about that later as well. I was doing lecturing in different universities, but I was also working uh, in this creative technology startup, Chuvi, um, as an industry researcher and data manager. Uh, Chuvi, um, was and still is an app and a web platform uh, that prices cinema tickets dynamically. I think they're still just in Australia and New Zealand, but there were plans to come into Europe as well. But in 2020, I decided to return back to Europe, and that is when I joined the Kudan Open Lab at Tallinn University. And there I'm currently doing a postdoc in cultural data analytics. So now briefly about Kudan. Um, you can see the website on top and also our Twitter page. Um, Kudan is an era chair project for cultural data analytics. So Kudan really aims at building a new analytical approach that integrates quantitative and qualitative methods, including aspects of network science, complexity science, machine learning, computational social science, science of science, data science, design research, visualization, art history, cultural semiotics, digital culture studies, and also creative industry studies, where most of my own work lies. So we integrate these aspects to work with digitized cultural heritage, as well as with born digital data acquired from contemporary platforms. So really it's an area of disciplines, uh, the methodologies from which we borrow, and also the subjects of interest from which we borrow. Uh, it's not me alone, we are a large team. I think now we have around seven postdocs, not around seven postdocs, working uh, as part of Kudan, as well as five PhD students. People there look at different things uh, from using machine learning uh, to study uh, the depiction of Soviet newsreels to looking at the trends in cinema, something that I do, uh, but also uh, applying semiotics to understand the subject of other or running linguistic uh, experiments. So you can look at the project that we have and also the team uh, of ours on Kudan webpage. This project was um, funded by European Commission and again it's an era chair project. All right, but enough about me, let's look at the subject of today. So cultural data analytics really does not happen without data. Uh, and we, when we think about cinema data, it can come in. Ah, sorry, I was looking at what was written on the screen. Uh, when we think about cinema data, it can really come in different forms. Um, so my own work mostly is relying on quantitative information, so quantitative data, and therefore most of it comes in sort of a tabular format, uh, such as, for example, Excel tables. Um, so those data sets that we analyze can range from very small uh, data sets of only a single Excel file, like the one I have as an example here on top left corner, 
Uh, this was a film and TV production data set that we collected in collaboration with the Australian Cinematographers Association. And it was just one table, 41 kilobytes in size, but it contained a lot of important information for us to analyze. Um, in that one Excel table, which was our primary data for that project, we were looking at different films. So we have here a title and then different roles that people undertake in those films, as well as people's names. Um, and later we added on also gender information. We'll speak more about these production data sets that contain gen gender and how uh, we can analyze them in later slides. Um, on the right, uh, on the top right hand corner, we see a very different database structure. And this is a very large database of film screenings, the Kinematics Global Theatrical Film Screening Database. Um, it is a relational database connecting six tables and weighting close to 80 gigabytes in size. So really quite large data. Uh, this was the database uh, with which I worked for my PhD back in Australia. Um, it spans two and a half years uh, and around 50 countries registering all film screenings that happened across close to 30, well, over 33,000 cinemas. Um, it's a simple database in a sense of its structure. It's only six tables connected through unique identifiers, but it is really large in size because we registered so many screenings of those films during the two and a half years, close to 340 million screenings in there. Um, a different database that we also work with uh, in collaboration with the Estonian Film Archive was different in a sense that it was much smaller. It's the one on the top uh, left, hand, oh, sorry, bottom left hand corner. In there, we only had 345 megabytes of data, yet its structure was very complex. We had close to 65 tables, 64 tables in there connected through unique identifiers. So, you know, the data can also come in a much more complex uh, structure. Lastly, uh, the last example I wanted to share with you was this database we received from Sinando in collaboration that we have with the Festival de Cannes Marché du Film. In there, the data was both structured in a complex manner as well as quite large in size. There we had 49 tables um, that weighted around 20 gigabytes. In here, um, it's a different uh, visualization of the database itself, not an entity diagram, uh, which were the FS database and the kinematics database. But in here, we were actually already using uh, network analysis methods to reimagine the structure of this database. Instead of plotting each table and connecting them through unique identifiers, which can become overwhelming when you have so many tables as it is on the left, when you look at the FS data, um, instead we used a network visualization method where each table became a node or a circle in a diagram and those circles were connected if there was a link in a database between tables. Such a depiction allowed us to much quicker, quicker see what entities were described in the database and how they were related to one another. I'll speak more about the Sinando case later in the presentation. Ah, excuse me. Now, another part of using the cultural data analytics methods is really the methods. And those are, of course, guided by the data that you have at hand, as well as the research questions which you want to answer using that data. It really can range from statistical methods, like you see the ones on the left. Uh, so, for example, plotting the correlation between variables, doing this exploratory visualizations uh, of just depicting the data you have at hand, as we have on the left hand uh, bottom corner. Um, and then it also can be a, a, then an application of network analysis methods. And uh, a lot of the work that I will show you today will indeed use these network analysis methods. It could be social network analysis, where you connect people uh, amongst themselves, themselves based on some relationship, as well as just network analysis that not, only that not necessarily focus on social aspect, but can connect any entities amongst themselves. Like the one at the bottom here, where for example, we'll, we were looking at the connections between films and festivals. And then of course, you can go as far as you want. It's an interdisciplinary study, this cultural data analytics approach. Uh, in our team, we have people working with machine learning. And for example, there we apply this visual machine learning to really see what's happening on screen, but then using, of course, these automated methods. In here is just a short depiction or small depiction of the large data set that we have on Soviet newsreels. 
in here, we're just representing a single newsreel as one uh, square, and we're looking at um, how many newsreels we had over the years. This is just a snapshot of the data that is available. But then, of course, uh, using these visual machine learning methods, we can try to understand what is happening on those newsreels. And then, of course, there are many more. Depending on, on, on how you form your teams, those interdisciplinary teams, you will have different people from different disciplines bringing in different methods that can be applied to different data sets. Um, today, I will not talk about machine learning. This is not something that I myself do. My own work mostly uses metadata about film industries. It could be screenings, it could be those production relationships that I mentioned, and so on. So the majority of presentation, which will now follow and show different examples of uh, my previous work, will indeed look at these um, different depictions of metadata. I forgot to mention, but if you have any questions, you can ask straight away. I will go through quite a number of projects, so perhaps you will forget <laughs> as we approach the end. So if you do have questions, uh, do not be afraid to ask. Maybe raise your hand or you can type them in chat. I'll try to see if I can, yeah, if I can see it. Uh, or maybe just speak up <laughs> because I have a presenter's view, so sometimes it's hard to see what's happening on the site. All right, so we talked about different data that we might have about film industries, different structures of the data, and also different methods that can be applied to the data based on your research questions. So now I will <clears throat> go for a couple of projects and then show you, <clears throat> apologies. Um, <clears throat> show you how that has been done in practice. So let's see time as well. Um, so I, when I started my academic career back in Australia, doing my PhD, we were working with this large kinematics database. So on the right, you can see a summary that you have already seen before. Um, it was a database listing film screenings around the world over two and a half years. So what we were really interested in, uh, working in collaboration with my supervisors, Deb Verhoeven and also Bronwyn Coat, uh, was to examine trends in international film distribution by looking at those theatrical screenings of films. Uh, we were looking at an overall picture, such as, for example, comparing the sizes of national cinema markets. This is the bubble diagram here in the middle. Uh, on the left um, of that middle diagram, we were looking just at the number of screenings uh, that happen in each country. And there we see the US being quite large, the purple circle. Uh, but then we also were working on integrating additional data sets um, uh, as the one on the right. So on the right, we have still this uh, depiction of the size of a cinema market based on screenings, but this time we're dividing them by population that is in the country. Um, and what becomes apparent is that the United States is no longer such a prominent um, national market within the global landscape. When we take their population into account, it's actually all of those English-speaking markets that are quite prominent. So here on the right, you see that in the middle, those large bubbles, we have US, we have Canada, we have Australia, New Zealand, and also Ireland. So really, uh, when we take population into account and do this comparison, uh, we see the prominence of, again, English speaking markets. So that was some of the questions that uh, we were asking, what are the trends? Um, how can the countries be compared based on the cinema screenings that happen in those countries and so on. But we also looked at, uh, in more detail, at some of the paired relationships between countries. For example, we were analyzing the US-Australia film trade relationship. Uh, for that, a sub-study, um, Next to our screening data set, we also introduced a data set on box office uh, of different films uh, that, were, that were made in the US and then traveled to Australia. So in the industry, between, you know, between distributors and producers, that were, there was this unwritten rule that Australia is simply 10% of the US is simply a smaller America. So if you have a film that you release, release in the US and it earns, let's say a hundred million dollars, once you ship it to Australia, it will earn 10% of that. So 10 million. But this rule was really unwritten and sort of a rough estimate uh, that distributors would make before they import films to Australia. So we decided to test it uh, by introducing this uh, box office statistics to our screenings data set. 
And we did it by different genres. So on the left, you see this bar chart uh, where we can see that uh, for some genres, the rule was quite fitting. So the, to get the percentage here, we're simply dividing box office in Australia by box office in the US. So we see that for some genres, like especially action adventure and animation, they're quite close to 10%. However, for other genres, the rule is not as fitting. For example, for horror, in Australia, horror movies only receive around 7% of the US earnings, meaning, meaning that perhaps Australians do not like uh, horror films as much as Americans do. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, we see the documentary, for instance, performs much better in Australia compared to the US. A documentary film, when it goes to Australia, will receive close to a quarter of its American earnings. So that was just uh, a small case study that, that we did to test this 10% rule. Let me see if I... Okay, concerning kinematics, how was the data on the screenings collected? Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks, Liz. Great question. Um, so the kinematics data set, uh, we did not collect it. We actually purchased data from a commercial provider um, that has that sort of relationship for the data acquisition has both benefits and drawbacks. drawbacks. The benefit was that uh, the data set was very extensive. It was running for two and a half years, registered many, many screenings. The drawback is, of course, that it was not collected for research purposes. Really, this data that the company, I think it's now out of existence, to be honest, but back in the day, the company was collecting the data uh, from different cinemas, sometimes by phoning them, sometimes by emailing them. With some of them, they, of course, had data dump relationships to collect information on their programming every week, because, of course, cinemas program uh, their screenings for each week. So. The company was collecting these programs and then they were reselling that data, for example, to Amazon, for example, to simply Google. Uh, so if you Google what's showing tonight uh, in Tallinn or what's showing tonight in Paris, um, without going to the websites of different cinemas, immediately you would see on top that at this and this hour, this and these films are showing. So that data is coming from the company from which we purchased it back in 2000, what was it, 2013, I think, we started the collection, um, and then we repurposed it for uh, our research use. It was not cheap, it was very expensive, maybe, I can't remember, thousands of dollars for one month of data. Um, and the collection itself, even when we were simply buying the data, was quite complicated because we would receive the data every week once the programming was out in XML files, based on which we then had to build this relational database. Uh, so the data was not only expanding all the time, but we also had to uh, restructure it so that we can work with it um, in an SQL format we chose at the time. I hope that answers the question. And if there are any more questions, do ask. All right, um, so using this data, as I mentioned, we were looking at these different uh, sizes of cinema markets, but then we also had a study on uh, box um, office earnings. Um, so that study on box office earnings, we published back in the day in a studies in Australasian cinema uh, journal. You can find it online. And our main uh, conclusion was really that we found no support for the 10% rule, but we did find strong evidence that audience states as well as distribution and exhibition practices do differ across regions, at least when it comes to Australia and the US. Um, so another thing that we did with the screening data set was really to start looking at the dimension of gender and gender diversity when it comes to film distribution. So in here, we were still working with the kinematics database of film screenings, but then um, algorithmically based on the first names of directors um, and back in the day there was this algorithm gender dice you could simply use online so we use that to detect people's gender based on first name unfortunately the algorithm only allows for binary men women categories so there was this drawback of the study of course um, but we did try uh, to identify the gender of uh, different films we had in the database, the gender of the director of different films, to then try and compare how films directed by women and films directed by men do get uh, distributed internationally. 
So we were looking at these theatrical distribution patterns um, as by the number of total number of film screenings across countries. So the paper that we wrote about this was called Redistributing Gender in the Global Film Industry. And we said beyond Me Too and Me Three. So Me Three, hashtag Me Three, we used because this statistic overall across the something like 40 countries we had was that films directed by women receive 3% of all theatrical screenings, meaning that films directed by men receive 97% of all screenings in theaters. Some countries did better than the others, for example, Finland, France, Sweden. In there, women's films received up to 8% of screenings. Note that, you know, equality would be perhaps 50-50. Here, we're not even reaching 10%. But then there were other countries in which women's films received under 2% of screenings, like Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Singapore, Thailand, and Ukraine. Um, so with this sort of depressing statistic, we thought, let's also look at the relationship between this film statistics and the overall uh, gender equality metrics across countries. So on the right, you see just a correlation a scatter plot showing correlation between our film and screenings index, just different indices looking at um, how many screenings uh, films by women received um, across or how you call it, in, in connection to the global gender gap index in the country. So global gender gap index uh, would just describe how gender equal a country is based on many, many metrics. And we compare that to how equal the cinema infrastructure of that based on gender is in that country. So we saw quite positive relationship in both film and screening index. These were just two ways of expressing uh, the same metric. Uh, where, for example, Nordic countries, like you see on the top right of the graph, Norway, Finland, Sweden, were performing quite well in both gender, gap, gender index and our cinema indices, whilst countries that had overall unequal societies based on gender, as depicted in that index, were also doing quite poorly within cinema infrastructures. I see there's another question in the chat. Let me see. What strategies do you think can tackle gender inequalities in the film industry? both from industry itself and from policymakers? Great question. <laughs> and maybe I'll answer that as we go to other, um, or to other studies with, it, uh, with gender, okay? Um, because, yeah, so we started with this. Oh, I see someone's, I think someone's microphone is on. Let me see. Oh, okay, I just muted someone. All right. Um, so we started really, yes, with this overall um, overview, looking at statistics on distribution. Um, and you can read about this uh, part of work in Media Industries Journal. Uh, but we sort of finished our discussion really saying that, and that the answer perhaps to the question is that policies designed to improve women filmmakers through remedial skills training are not the answer and have the effect of suggesting that women themselves are the cause of their own statistical failure. However, individual women are not the architects or the operators of their own industry-wide inequality. Male domination of the world's film industries will not decline until there is a different distribution of the film industry's resources. So already at the end of this article, we were starting to uh, try and move the focus from women or improving women and then doing, you know, implementing policies that improve women filmmakers to moving our attention to men in the industry. Um, so the later work that we did, and this time it was uh, centering at uh, production in the film industry was using the social network analysis to understand this networked nature of work in film and how the gender inequality happens uh, there. I see another question. Ah, thank you. Okay. Yes, Carla. So I'll come back uh, to more suggestions of what can be done, but um, let's let's move through these as well. So basically, most of them. Most of the cinema centers uh, around the world do now look at uh, the metric of gender equality or inequality in their industries. However, however, those metrics are often simply counting women. So counting women directors, women producers, or perhaps films made by women or, and so on. However, um, 
we thought, or especially Deb Verhoeven, the PI uh, of ours at the time, also my PhD supervisor, thought that those methods are not producing change. Uh, so Deb uh, was, uh, had been working on improving gender diversity in the Australian film industry for many years, however, with little effect. Uh, when she started as an activist in the 1980s, women's participation in cinema industries was of a similar level than it was back in 2010s. In some roles, women's participation actually decreased. Uh, so Deb was describing when she was uh, building uh, these uh, methodologies or adapting the methodologies from network science to now looking at cinema, um, the whole work as her mid-life existential crisis of just seeing that really she's been working on this for so long, but there was no effect. So her idea then was to shift the focus uh, from women to men and men's labor relationships to women within the industry to perhaps uh, find new ways of how the situation could be improved. Now, why analyze relationships in film production? Well, labor in the film industry is organized around teams. And in those teams, or to build those teams, personal and professional networks are very important to find and secure work in the industry. Now, why use social network analysis? Well, social network analysis um, precisely enables examining these labor structures. Uh, and it also yields this relationship-based statistics to describe gender diversity within the industry, such as, for example, the number of men who do not work with women or the percentage of projects with women in minority. All right, so we know why, now let's look at how. So how do we analyze uh, film production as a network? Uh, so to step back a little bit, uh, what is a network? Well, network is really, networks are everywhere and they describe relationships. Uh, in network terms, you have entities which are shown with these circles, and these are called nodes. In social network analysis, these are people, and those nodes are connected together with an edge, and an edge is simply a link which describes some sort of a relationship between two entities or two people. So to analyze project-based collaboration networks, we looked at key roles firstly, producer, director, and writer. And we were looking at directed hiring relationships drawn from producers. In the film industry, producers are the ones that do most of the hiring. Uh, so in this network analysis, we would build uh, the network by looking at producers, directors, and writers, and drawing these connections from producer to other creatives. In here, we were coloring women in blue and men in red, just to flip it. And, and, and at the bottom, you see these examples. So for example, you might have one film on which there worked two men and one woman, a man producer who hired a man director and the man, same man producer hired a female writer. So that's how you would show it in a network visualization. So we started by looking at networks in Australia. Now, to really build those network visualizations, you need quite a few years of data, uh, simply because films take quite a few years to be made. Uh, so we always looked at a 10 year period. So in Australia, we started from 2006 going to 2015, and we connect, uh, collected information on people working in different teams to produce films. So we had information on producers, writers, and directors, and we were drawing those networks from producer to the other crew. Now on the right, you see the visualized network uh, of production relationships. But quickly becomes evident is that there, are, there is much more red or many more men active in the network. There are also many teams that are men only. Uh, so the, you know, the red circles connected with red lines, many more teams of men only than there are teams of women only um, creatives working together. In the middle, there's this hairball um, and it's not some sort of a cluster of people who work together repeatedly. It is actually just a single film, which is called The Turning. And that was a film made of, I think, 10 short films that each had its producer, director, and often multiple writers. And that is why we have such a cluster in there. And so just to explain. Um, so when we use these social network visualizations or social network analysis methods, uh, applying them to film production networks, we do get these networks, network graphs and there are telling in a way, but what we also get are these network-based statistics 
uh, we were especially interested in looking at the percentage of men producers who worked with zero women. And to our, well, dissatisfaction of, you know, with the situation, we saw that around 40% of men in Australia over 10 years had worked with zero women. If we expanded that metric to include zero to one woman, 75% or three quarters of all men producers had not worked with zero or one, or had not worked with two women. They work with zero or one woman. If we looked at the overall project, so how many projects had women in minority, that was close to 80%. So this was sort of the first step. And then we thought, okay, maybe Australia is just this really gender unequal society, especially when it comes to film. What happens if we look at different countries? So then we expanded our analysis to two European countries, Sweden and Germany. Um, as you can see from the visualizations, the networks themselves look quite different. Germany, in Germany, over those 10 years, we had have many more films, close to one and a half thousand. In Sweden, we have similar number of films, but the network structures are overall different. And if we look at more science network statistics, they are different too. And those you can find in the paper, I'll show you uh, the link uh, on the next slide. But what became evident and so striking that we had to rerun all of the network statistics because we couldn't believe it, was that those network-based statistics across countries were so similar. In all of these countries, around 45% of men producers worked with zero women across 10 years. Close to three quarters of producers worked with zero to one woman. And close to 80% of projects had women in minority when it comes to those key creative roles of producer, director, and writer. Um, so we not only plotted the networks, we also did many things in the networks. We tried different experiments of what external shocks could be introduced to those networks to make them, them more open for women's participation. And maybe there is the answer to the question we had before of what could be done to improve women's situation in those networks. So you can read a bit more about the different network experiments and the whole study in this article we published in PLUS, Plus One. We called it Controlling for Openness in the Male-Dominated Collaborative Networks of the Global Film Industry. But really the main finding was that the most critical factor for improving network openness is not simply the statistical improvement of the number of women in the network, nor is it the removal of men who do not work with women. The most likely behavioral changes to a network will involve the production of connections between women and powerful men. So, Later on, we decided to apply the same social network analysis methods to different contexts. Uh, this project was made in collaboration with the Australian Cinematographer Society. Before, we only looked at the key creative roles of director, writer, and producer. However, of course, if you don't have cameramen, you will not have a film. So for the later study, we focused on roles in cinematography. Um, in there, because we were working in close collaboration with the industry partner ACS, uh, we were able to do actually a mixed methods approach. So not only did we work with this uh, database of uh, film production collaborations, uh, like the Excel tables I showed you before to build these network graphs, we also ran a survey, uh, which was co-developed with the ACS, the industry partner, and which we sent to the members of their cinematographer society. Um, in here on the right, the social network I'm showing you is the network now drawn from directors of photography, so DOPs, to other camera crew. So again, this hiring relationship, but now within camera departments. Again, we have women in blue and men in red. Now, what becomes striking straight away is that the network is even more overwhelmingly red. There are very few of those blue uh, nodes, blue circles, which represent women working in camera departments in Australia. Uh, however, when we show these network visualizations to the industry partner, for them, they were not too comprehensible. <laughs> so the report that is currently in print and will be available soon, which we called Workforce Development and Diversity in Australian Cinematography, uh, do not include the network visualizations. Uh, instead, in there, we had perhaps more comprehensible descriptions of what's happening in camera departments. Uh, for one of them, uh, the scissor diagram I'm showing here, we were looking at career progression 
and what happens to women's participation within the camera department as they progress um, to most um, highly ranked roles. Uh, in here again, women are shown in blue, men are shown in red, and we differentiate between TV and film. Oh yeah, for this project, we also had information on television. Um, so we see that camera attachment, the lowest ranking role in there, women start at almost the same level as men. Uh, cl close to 50% of camera attachment are women when it comes to TV, and close to 30% of camera attachment are women when it comes to film. However, as they progress through the stages of their career, women drop off significantly. So significantly that at the highest ranking role of director of photography, we only have 10% of women left in the industry. And that metric now becomes the same for both TV and film. Because we had a survey component uh, for the study, we were also able to ask questions as of why and how does that happen? Uh, so in the report, you would be able to read, we will, we will be able to read more about this, but in here, I just had one quote from a survey respondent. Um, she was saying that the hiring practices of the camera department are deeply discriminatory. It's incrementally more inclusive than it was when I became a part of it five years ago, but decisions are still being made by the same predominantly white, heterosexual, male-identifying people aged in their 40s and 70s, and nothing will change until there is a diversity in positions of power. Another study that we are currently running at Kudan looks at Soviet newsreels, and I mentioned it already before. So having this data set of production relationships in Soviet newsreels allowed us to apply these social network um, methods that we developed to look at uh, gender compositions in film production to a historical context, and also a context that is a bit different than you know, the production of feature films. This is concerning the production of newsreels. So what are newsreels? News newsreels are these short clips that used to be shown in cinemas before the main feature. Now we have advertisements, but back in the day we had newsreels. We developed this project together with NetFilm, and that is a Russian film archive, and they have a quite an extensive collection of Soviet newsreels. Uh, in many parts of the world, newsreels well, became extinct, extinct a bit earlier, but in the Soviet Union, they were actually running in theaters up until 92. So the data set that we have is quite a long spanning. It goes from 1945 to 1992. In here, for the Soviet uh, newsreel production, uh, the roles for each newsreel on which we had information were um, director, cinematographers, text editors, and other crew, because they were so sure that there would be no producer, really. Um, so we did sort of a similar analysis, again, plotting the social networks, but now drawing relationships from director to other crew. And we colored women in purple and men in green, and we also sized these bubbles by the number of connections that people had. What becomes immediately evident in comparison to previous network visualizations is that here we have many and very prominent women, those purple nodes. On the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, you see on the left the same visualization, but side to side we have these um, also some additional statistics about people in this network. So when it comes to Soviet newsreel, over those 50 years, uh, when we count the number of connections, so between directors and other crew by gender, and we rank people by their most central position in the network, so by the number of connections that they have, in the top 10, seven out of 10 directors are actually women as you see on the right. And these are those large purple circles. If we look at the number of jobs uh, that directors uh, receive, over half of all director roles, 51%, went to women back in the day, in, oh, back in, the day, in Soviet newsreels. However, when, when we look at the cinematographers, the data is actually really similar to what we see today in Australia. Only 9% of women were working as cinematographers. Now, we have to be cautious, of course, how we interpret such data. Based on this, it might seem that Soviet Union was this per perfect place for women to make films. However, what we have to take into account is that we're looking at Soviet newsreels. Newsreels were these short clips, short documentary clips of quite low importance within the larger ecosystem of film production. 
We also looked at the longevity of people's careers in those newsreels. And these prominent women, they would stay producing newsreels for 10, 20, 30 years sometimes. While for men, what we saw is that men would join the newsreel production network, they would make some newsreels, but in a year or two or three, they would be out. Meaning that they would probably go to make feature films or other productions with larger budgets and maybe more interesting topics, while women were really getting stuck making those newsreels decades and decades onwards. So again, this interpretation always has to be made, of course, on the you know, context of the data. The last project that I wanted to tell you about um, is this project looking at public value of open cultural data. We run it at the Tallinn University, but also in collaboration with uh, Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, and in here, we studied the complex ways in which cultural data or cultural open data solutions would produce public value. And then we investigate how new open data technologies such as the semantic web and blockchain, could be seen as conditioning the emergence of new kinds of innovation systems. We develop new tools for understanding how value is produced within these innovation systems. We have um, six partners overall um, at the moment, because I mostly work with film. My main partner is Festival de Cannes, and with them we work uh, using this uh, Sinando database I showed you before. So I'll tell a little bit about that project. Um, so. Sananda database that you've seen uh, before is really a database listing information on people, films, and companies that are active within the festival circuit. In here, we reimagine it using a data model where we see connections between different entities within the database. Um, with these data models, um, what is interesting perhaps is that where, where you have two entities, such as, for example, film and event or film and crew, each of those links can become a network visualization in itself. Uh, so one of the initial studies we have done uh, using this Nanda data was looking at this connection between films and festivals. So in here, we have a network visualization, but this time it's not looking at how people connect amongst themselves in a production setting, but rather how films travel the festival circuit. So in here, we are showing both films and festivals. Films are shown in Indigo, uh, sorry, films are shown in dark blue and festivals are shown in indigo. Um, there is a link between a film and a festival if a film is uh, featured on a festival's program. This is just an um, exploratory visualization, um, which we use to start our discussions of how to continue with this work. Uh, but I wanted to show you this as, as an example of how else we can use network analysis to move away from uh, looking at the people's connection to all connections to also look at connections between different entities such as films and festivals. So this is all that I have for you. There were quite many projects, I think. But uh, really, uh, the takeaway message I wanted to share with you is that cultural data analytics offers a new approach for studying cinema. Um, and studies taking a cultural data analytics approach are data-driven, and they focus on identifying the most suitable methodologies for answering the proposed research questions using data at hand. So we have to think about what we want to find out from the data and also what data we actually have. And new ways of seeing the phenomena within the realm of international cinema, we think are born via collaborative interdisciplinary work. So on each of the slides I showed you, I don't know if you noticed, but there are many, many people who took part in uh, actually undertaking this work. Uh, we have people from different disciplines, from computer scientists to network scientists, to semioticians, to the ones who study culture and creative industries. And with them, we collaborate to produce this work. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, we can take them now. Thanks. See the chat as well. Okay, so I don't think we have anything in the chat, um, but maybe we have something from the audience that you wanted to ask.
If not, that I'm not sure what the protocol is, but uh, then perhaps we finish early, or if there are any questions, we can still take them. Hi, I still have a question. question. Yes. Uh, it might have been a, a bit too fast, but you said that you were able to um, compare the gender inequalities in Austria with Germany and uh, Sweden. Would that mm -hmm. mean that the data set is, or the criteria to do that uh, comparison is freely available? So if you were to, or if I were to say, I have this data for Belgium, for instance, um, mm -hmm. Would it be able? Would I be able to to use uh, the criteria and just say, okay, I I, I can compare it now with with these four uh, three other data sets? Um, yes, uh, in in principle, yes. Um, that's sort of how how we did it as well. So we were first looking at this Australian network, and really the data that we need is uh, simply or not simply, but. Um, the registry of all roles undertaking, undertaken by people to make films. In here, we looked at producers, writers, and directors. Um, maybe I can go back a little bit and just show you the structure of data that we used. Let me see. So yeah, for example, like the one on top that we had from Australian Cinematographer Society, we would just take a title of a film, then we would have the roles. There we looked at cinematographers, but we would have perhaps director, producer, and writer, and we have people's names. Of course, we don't show names in overall networks because of privacy, but then the gender would have to be added also. So the gender might be identified manually, or when we had these real large data sets, we also use these gender identification algorithms sometimes. So, but really all we need is knowing that these people collaborated on these roles, uh, on these um, specific films. And then from this, uh, the data uh, that is structured in that way, um, we can build um, different uh, expressions. For network analysis, we need a table of nodes, so all unique people uh, with their gender, and also a table listing edges that would be connections between people to people on those films. And then for these visualizations, we use Gephi software. So there we would then run the network visualization with Gephi and then color the people by their gender. Uh, so from the Gephi software, you would get the visualizations um, that might look similar to this. Uh, but then uh, you would, of course, also be able to look at the data itself and then count, let's say, how many men in the network you see as having no connections with women how many men you have as you see as having zero to one connections to women. And then overall, let's say how many of the projects have women in minority. Uh, there are more stats, of course, that you can get from Gephi, the network statistics. And in the paper that we have here, you can also see them. So we were looking at the density of the networks. We were looking at, I think, assortativity, overall the number of people and number of connections. So all of that can be replicated. Um, if if we if you have the data available we had a small study with luxembourg for example they collected also information about their own film production um so I, we ran a small site study with them just uh, as a means for the luxembourgish producers association to then use to argue what is the situation right now in luxembourg and then hopefully implement some policies to change it but I would be happy to also collaborate and uh, work on this perhaps with you if there's interest and you have the data. Just a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, film production and television productions don't have set start and ending days that are that easily uh, managed. Um, how did you decide on the start and the end date of your data set? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. We always needed at least 10 years of data uh, just to be able to build these network visualizations because, of course, for film at least, it takes so many years to make films. So if you just have maybe two years of data, let's say in a visualization, sorry, like this, you might have some people, but very few connections because people might be just connected through one film, perhaps. Um, with television, it may be the issue is not as present because the production levels are a bit higher. So perhaps for television, you could have a shorter period of maybe just five years. Um, in this, um, 
for these visualizations, we always took um, the year of a completed production as the date. So we don't really know for how many years people were working on the project. It might be that they had been working for 10 years up until it was completed. We simply looked at the date or the year of completion for both television and film. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ah, maybe just a small comment also on the networks. Um, on the Kinematics webpage, let me go back. To just show you how it is spelled. Yeah, kinematics.com. Uh, we also published, uh, I think, two blog posts exactly how we were doing, we were building those networks. So how the data was structured um, and how we, you know, build the networks using Gephi. So you might also just see on the kinematics.com. They will be from some years ago, but there are quite detailed description also of how you can do the social network analysis. I see a chat. Ah, very so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. Any other questions? If not, then perhaps we finish here. Um, maybe, uh, Filmi, you could advise me if we uh, we have the power to close the meeting. Oh, but let me see if there's a chat. Ah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending.